At this point in the career of the Batman, he's been at it for a couple of three years, and he's a little wiser, a little older, and a little more sophisticated than he was in season one and season two. In season three, I think um, we were pretty happy with uh, the fact that we were able to, to you know, develop Batman's sort of maturity level, and um, by the end of the season, he's ready for new challenges. We try to work within the mythology of the Batman, and we're talking obviously 60 some years of it, and at the same time, you know, we don't want to do exactly what's done before. We look for stories that have sort of been told in the Batman world, and we try to do our spin on it. I think ultimately it's about Batman, the the prototypical loner, sort of uh, expanding his sort of circle and learning to rely on others. And, and if anything, that's the arc of season three, is that uh, he comes to accept Batgirl and, and realize there's room for other people in his life. What? Wait, wait a minute. But you haven't even seen my costume. From the beginning, we talked about the eventual bringing in of a partner for Batman, and, and we thought we'd do Batgirl. Why not? It'd be fun. Batman is a loner. He's very quiet. He thinks he knows it all. And and Batgirl's character in the show, she's much more sarcastic. She's always trying to like nudge him, you know, get him to have a little bit more of a, a good time when he's fighting crime, if that's possible. You know, adding a sidekick certainly changes the dynamic a bit. Um, Batman is still Batman, but now there's contrast. Here's this little pipsqueak girl coming in and you know, showing him that he can't do everything by himself and maybe he needs a partner to help him out. I definitely think this version of Batgirl is a lot different than a lot of the previous versions. First of all, she's a lot younger. She's a teenager. And I think with that, you know, there's a, there's a different innocence you have to bring into it. And she's not really an established superhero yet, so she's maybe not as confident in herself. There were reasons we brought Batgirl in before Robin, but um, it was something that we had to think quite a bit about, well, we're bringing her in before Robin. How can we have fun with that? How can we make it feel natural? It's nice to kind of shake things up, and, and I like bringing Batgirl in first because it, it definitely adds a different dynamic to it. It's okay to show yourself. You're not on our most wanted list anymore. Force of habit. We had always planned on bringing in um, Gordon into the series uh, as his sort of police contact and friend in the police force. Putting him here was a very organic fit for us because he's Barbara's dad, so we have a lot of storylines that just pertain to their relationship with each other, um, and then her relationship to her sort of new surrogate father, Batman. So it's sort of, it was a perfect time to introduce him, I think. Our Commissioner Gordon is uh, pretty traditional. He's, he's no nonsense, and uh, you know, nobody can ruffle his feathers. You know, nobody, not Batman, not Joker, not any of these villains. Get this cuckoo to Arkham where he belongs. Bringing in the bat signal and commercial going at the same time was calculated in the sense that we needed that person the bat, that Batman has on the inside for that relationship to turn on the signal saying, you know, we Gotham need you. So that's, you know, plus in all the comics I've read, I, I can't imagine a bat signal without Commissioner Gordon. I think it'd just be strange. Ever since Bat Breath got that signal, my lead time's been chopped in half. We try to think through how often are we going to uh, see the perennial characters like Penguin, Joker, and how often are we going to bring in a new character that we've never seen. And we always like to invent a couple of characters ourselves, so, you know, we kind of try to find a place for that. Ivy, to be exact. Poison Ivy. Our take on Poison Ivy was obviously very married to uh, our take on Batgirl. You know, we, we were going to use Poison Ivy in one of the earlier seasons, and for whatever reason, we held off and it actually worked out. You know, we just thought it would be neat to now bring her in as Barbara Gordon's friend. You know, it gave more meat to the origin. She's now a contemporary for Batgirl rather than Batman's contemporary. We did that just because the season's sort of a lot about Batgirl, so we wanted to have her have specific villains to just give her some drama in her storyline, a character arc for her to go, you know, to see her friend go bad, just like we had Batman and Ethan Bennett went bad. It's cool, it's different, I like how they did it. They start out as best friends. Later, Red, you two have fun. But uh, Pam kind of stabs her in the back and decides to go off and become Poison Ivy. On our show, we like to take lesser known villains and then try to like amplify them a little bit, maybe contemporize them a little. That's like one of our favorite things to do. Maxi Zeus was a overweight character in a toga and now he's a ironclad warrior. I think it's a fun direction to go with him. There is only room on New Olympus for one legend. 
I think what made it work for us was um, when we hit on the idea of a, of a politician, you know, wanting to take control and then just being so angry like a child that he just uses his big toys to take things over anyway. If you won't vote for me, I'm taking over. Thankfully, Zeus is not the only billionaire in Gotham to have built a flying machine. The Batwing was another thing that we always wanted to bring into the show. When we started talking about the Maxi Zeus story, we realized with having an airship up above Gotham and how would Batman get up there, it just naturally, organically developed that we would be able to bring in the Batwing for that story. Gearhead will be looking for the next rush, and this is one villain the Batman needs wheels to take down. Gearhead was actually a, uh, I guess, a minor Batman villain, and we actually kind of retrofitted him, and, and we took, you know, Gearhead, and, and we made him more of a speed freak and a driver, you know, a literal Gearhead. He's one of my favorite designs of the season. He's just an asymmetrical character. He's got one huge arm. I think his colors are cool. I use, like, Enter the Dragon Bruce Lee colors on him. I think it looks really cool. <laughs> Traded up, Batman. That was a case where we knew we wanted to bring in the new Batmobile, so uh, you know we wanted to do sort of like the ultimate car chase episode. So it sort of made sense. We want to destroy the Batmobile and make it an event. You know, make it really dramatic. How very odd. Not odd, Alfred. Strange. Hugo Strange was one of our favorite characters, but we wanted to make him a major villain. So he was sort of the the major baddie from the season. As it grew, you found out he was behind a lot of the bad things that were going on, so we wanted to elevate him to a, to an A-lister as much as we could as a guy behind the scenes. He just simply enjoys manipulating people and, um, and particularly has this interest in Batman that he's deep-seated, but he just simply is pulling strings and making things happen for his own sort of amusement and to me it's just a real fascinating villain. Now let's get the old gang back together. I hear we have a big job to do. Keeping the Batman fresh for the third season isn't a difficult task when you've got great stories, we have great characters, great animation, great music put together in a way that not only resonates with the fans, but represents great filmmaking for television as well. We have been raising the bar for the Batman. When we started season three, we overall just had the mandate to make it just better, and I think it is by far a, a better season than the rest. It's like somebody opened up the, the treasure chest of 60 years of great Batman stories and said, okay, here, pick and choose, and sort of retell it, you know, in a more condensed form, and, and that's been really neat.